1624 approached, Plymouth was doing pretty well. New reinforcements had arrived, and on the ship that brought them, colonists had been able to send back some timber and beaver skins, and they kept a small ship to cruise up and down the coast fishing and fur trading. Bradford's switch from communal to private farming had eliminated food shortages almost immediately. Instead of simply doing what they perceived to be their duty, the colonists were now doing whatever was necessary to keep the crops growing. Women worked in the fields, whereas they had previously stayed home to raise the children. The year would, however, bring the conflict which made Bradford the angriest, and which he would continue to fume about long after the irritation over Weston and the pain of the first winter had dissipated. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvala, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. First, though, it brought that first batch of settlers, which included a 20-something man named Captain Emanuel Altam. He was a friend of Pocock's and a Puritan son of London merchants and lawyers, in a family that had become one of the most elite in the kingdom. And in fact, he was related by marriage to Oliver Cromwell. He had sold his inheritance to invest in the company and moved to New England, where he quickly made a good impression on Bradford. He also admired Massasoit. Altam captained a new ship called the Little James, which he kept in New England. His crew signed up for six years with the Plymouth Colony as shareholders rather than wage earners. And that meant that instead of being paid up front, they'd make their money by receiving a portion of the vessel's profits from fishing and trading. In the meantime, investors would pay for their food, drink, and clothing. The problem was that they expected their activities to include piracy. The war party of the time did advocate piracy against the Spanish as a way of provoking war. Plus, doing piracy meant that working as a shareholder could earn them lots of money, much more than a simple wage could. This was a promise that fishing and trading couldn't make. So, on their way to America, they saw a French ship sailing to La Rochelle, and they prepared to plunder it. Altam stopped them, which made his stance on piracy clear. There would be no French and Spanish riches for them. By the time they reached America, they were angry enough to go on strike and demand an interim payment of cash, which Bradford agreed to pay himself. The next spring, Altam took the little James to Maine with a crew that was even angrier, having spent the winter in Plymouth hungry, cold, and having gotten nothing they could be paid for. On the way to Maine, the crew mutinied, threatened to kill Altam and blow up the ship, and forced him to sail back to Plymouth by small boat to get some supplies. Winslow accompanied Altam back to Maine, taking bread and peas. The mutiny seemed to be dissipating until a storm hit, which drowned the ship's master and two of its crew, and the mutineers refused to help salvage the vessel. Altam and Plymouth were able to pay some local mariners to salvage the ship, but thanks to the mutineers, they'd lost all of the small boats used for doing business on the coast, along with salt, codfish, supplies, and trading goods, as well as all of Altam's books and most of his personal belongings. He had lost everything, and he ended up having to sell the ship along with a small cargo of fish. Bradford hadn't gotten around to paying the crew, so when the mutineers returned to London, they sued the London investors for the 40 pounds that Bradford had promised them. Altam stayed in America for a year and then sent a letter asking his brother to mention his name to Samuel Argall, who was planning to found a new plantation. He said he thought he might be useful with his new world experience and knowledge of the land and its people. Argall himself would die before any plantation plans materialized, 
but Alton returned to London. His inheritance was gone, so he joined the East India Company as a military commander and agent, and was stationed in the first British base in India, at Armagon, near modern-day Chennai. He found a heap of mud, but rebuilt the fort's defenses and died there a few years later, after which the company abandoned the post and moved 40 miles south to Fort St. George. Alton's story didn't really affect New England, but it's a sad reminder of the precariousness of life in the New World, even for someone who had already inherited a fair amount. We've heard so many stories of people fleeing desperation in one form or another, but even for someone who showed all signs of great success, just one bad decision could destroy it. Back in Plymouth, the main problem was also financial. They still hadn't sent many beaver pelts to England, and investors were cooling on the idea of this Plymouth colony. Fortunately for the pilgrims, though, The English economy was reviving, and people were more willing to start investing in New England again. The next ship to Plymouth brought the colony's first major supply of goats, pigs, cows, and horses, as well as the return of Thomas Morton, who had previously left with the Wessagusset settlers. It also brought a minister sent by the merchant adventurers, who were led by Pocock at this point and his name was John Lyford. Lyford had studied at Oxford. Between Oxford and Cambridge, Cambridge was definitely the more Puritan-leaning school, but there certainly wasn't 100% division. Lyford had then gone on to be a preacher in the Church of Ireland, which was an ideal position for a Puritan, because King James had allowed ministers in Ireland to implement whatever Puritan policies they wanted to. They didn't have to do any of the high church rituals they disapproved of, like pledging allegiance to the Book of Common Prayer or making the sign of the cross or wearing the surplice. This meant that Puritans who didn't want to compromise their ideas could move to Ireland to help convert the locals. The Church of Ireland had become dominated by Puritans, and Lyford had chosen to settle in one of the most contentious counties. In Ireland, he had had an illegitimate child, and then a second one. Then he got married, but after his marriage, he got caught having raped a woman, and after that, he was expelled from the Church of Ireland and forced to return to London. That's where he'd connected with Pocock, who had sent him to Plymouth as a new minister. The merchant adventurers had already sent one minister, but he'd simply stayed a year living quietly, writing Latin poems, and leaving everyone alone. Given Lyford's life story, it seems safe to say that he preferred fighting to poetry. One of the most fundamental beliefs in Brownist ideology was that the church should be run as an Athenian democracy. None of Plymouth's pilgrim leadership would accept a man as pastor who hadn't been elected. And in fact, they didn't even consider him to be legitimately ordained if they hadn't voted on his ordination. They were about democracy to decide how a society and its religion should be run. But remember that Puritanism in general, and Brownism in particular, were not about the freedom to do as you wanted. They were about obedience to the common will, and Lyford wasn't it. What's more, he wasn't sent to be it. Publicly, Lyford made a tearful confession of his faith, but it sounded phony and Bradford was skeptical. He didn't call him out, though. He just kept an eye on him. Lyford almost immediately joined with another non-pilgrim named John Oldham, who himself had already sent letters to London criticizing the colony and its leadership to the merchant investors. These criticisms had included criticism of everyday life, policy, and even the colony's religious nature. Lyford 
joined in sending these letters. He ran a serious risk of driving away influential supporters, especially because the Pilgrims hadn't been able to give investors a return on their money. When confronted, Lyford denied the accusations, but he also baptized the children of one of the non-Pilgrims in the colony. Bradford was determined to find out what was going on, so he asked the captain of the next boat carrying mail to England to pause after they were beyond the view of the Plymouth colonists. Bradford then followed in a small boat, intercepted the vessel, and opened Lyford's mail. There he found it full of accusations, many of which Bradford said were false. It seemed clear that Lyford and Oldham were partnering with a faction of investors at home in planning to overturn the religious and political leadership of the colony, ending the independence movement within the colony, and turning it into a mainstream Puritan town. Bradford didn't confront Lyford right away. He waited to see how the situation developed. One Sunday, Lyford and his supporters refused to join the Pilgrim Congregation for Services, setting up their own church with Lyford as a minister. And at this point, Bradford had had enough. He put Lyford and Oldham on trial, and Lyford denied the accusations. So Bradford produced the letters and showed them to the entire colony. Lyford said he'd just been repeating complaints from people like Billington But Billington and the others denied having participated. They said that while they'd gone to his meetings, they would never have consented to something like this. It was clear that Lyford and Oldham had to go. The Pilgrims had come to America to build a colony that adhered to their religious and political ideals, and the two were putting that mission at serious risk. The colonists put Oldham through a gauntlet where the settlers beat him with the butt ends of their muskets, and then both he and Lyford were sentenced to exile. Oldham would be expelled immediately, but since Lyford had a wife and kids, they let him stay six months to take care of them. Lyford made a second, even more tearful confession of faith, but he immediately began to write letters to London again, And then his wife came forward and told the colonists about his previous affairs and illegitimate children, as well as the rape he had committed in Ireland. Lyford and Oldham briefly stayed with a new band of colonists at Nam Kiag, which would later become Salem. And from there, they hitched a ride to Virginia, where Lyford seems to have been made a minister at either the West's or John Martin's plantation, but died just a few months later. Oldham later apologized for his participation in the affair and rejoined the Plymouth colony. In London, the Lyford affair nearly tore the investors apart. Investors split into two groups, but most of the company's powerful backers supported Lyford, including, of course, Pocock. In fact, the majority of all investors backed Lyford, and he had as his advocate a well-known Puritan lawyer named John White. In just a few years, White himself would be elected to Parliament in 1640 for the radical London seat of Southwark as an outspoken foe of the bishops and King Charles. So Lyford and his London associates weren't meek and mild Anglicans. They were the most radical of Puritans out there. London investors wrote to Plymouth accusing the settlers of being contentious, cruel, and hard-hearted toward anyone who didn't fully agree with them in all matters, both religious and civil. Meanwhile, Bradford said that Oldham and Lyford were evil, profane, and perverse, a human manifestation of the Antichrist, and malignants. And malignant was a term which was mostly reserved for Catholics, meaning a willful sect in rebellion against God. After the Civil Wars, it would become a word used for cavaliers who refused to submit to Puritan rule. 
Morton also chimed in on the event, saying that Lyford was a moderate Puritan, a diligent preacher, and a hardworking man who was both honest and laudable. There's probably some truth to all, or at least most, of these perspectives, and it's sadly difficult to get a real picture of the event. It is, however, one of the more interesting stories from Plymouth Colony. And the Lyford affair did enough financial damage to Plymouth that Standish ended up having to go to London to raise money himself, and even then he ended up borrowing at an interest rate of 50%. They were able to send 500 beaver skins back, but pirates captured the ship. Then, within a year of the affair, John Robinson was dead. Even from Holland, he'd been their heart and their guide, rebuking them when they behaved poorly and encouraging them when they were struggling. Brewster took control as Plymouth's spiritual leader, but the congregation didn't warm to another minister for decades, even as John Cotton achieved widespread acclaim among Puritans everywhere. In the couple years after Robinson's death, nearly a quarter of Plymouth's residents decided to relocate, either back to England or to Virginia or to Maine. Brownism was always noted for its twin sides of enthusiasm and bitterness, and both of those had already shown up multiple times through Plymouth's short history. It's not hard to imagine that without Robinson's guidance, and without a suitable substitute, and in the aftermath of the Lyford affair, Plymouth became a place which was much more inhospitable to the strangers. Even Billington would find himself hanged for murder just five years later. A new settlement was started just to the north of Wessagusset, but everybody quickly relocated except for Thomas Morton, who dubbed his little home Marymount, and proceeded to live in a way that represented everything the pilgrims disapproved of. He read Greek and Latin classics, wrote dirty poems, erected a maypole, and spent his Sundays hunting and drinking with the Indians. He was also willing to give the Indians guns because that allowed them to get him more furs. The Indians, unsurprisingly, preferred trading with him, and Bradford ultimately sent Standish to capture him. Morton echoed Pexuot's critical mockery of Standish, saying that it was almost comical to see such fury in a man who had been forced to shorten his sword by six inches to prevent it from dragging on the ground. And he said that the Massachusetts showed more humanity than the Pilgrims, and that he had better quarter with them. When a former Plymouth resident had to intercede in an altercation between Standish and some fishermen, That man also noted Standish's violence and said that Standish had never entered the school of our Savior Christ, or if he was ever there, he'd forgotten his first lessons to offer violence to no man. The next year, the merchant adventurers disbanded, and Bradford, Brewster, Winslow, Standish, Alden, Howland, Allerton, and Thomas Prince agreed to assume the colony's debts in exchange for a monopoly on the fur trade. Bradford had never been financially talented, so they did continue to struggle to pay off this debt, but in the meantime, they started to trade with the Indians for more than just fur, also for land. They developed a close relationship with the new Dutch colony, which had been founded at Manhattan, called New Netherland, And it was residents of this colony who introduced the pilgrims to the shell beads that would become the region's currency, and which would ultimately allow Plymouth to become a minor regional trading power, which ensured its future financial survival. It's also a Dutch trading agent who provides us with an interesting last image of Plymouth Colony before we move on to Massachusetts Bay. When we started this series, we saw John Robinson's congregation, lost, confused, and thankful for any sources of strength or confidence that they could find. 
Five years later, Dutch traders described Plymouth as an armed fortress where every male worshipped with a gun at his side. On a typical Sunday, they assembled by beat of drum, each with his musket or firelock, in front of the captain's door, cloaks on, in order, three abreast, and led by a sergeant without beat of drum. Next comes the governor, Bradford, wearing a long robe, and beside him on the right hand, a preacher with his cloak on, and on the left, the captain, Standish, with his cloak on and carrying his sidearms, as well as a small cane. They march in order, then sit, constantly on guard, night and day. I've referenced the contrasts to Virginia history throughout this series, and the contrast includes the story's final outcome. Virginia grew into into a society dominated by individual emigration and a society so void of population centers that law enforcement was virtually impossible and lawmaking virtually irrelevant. Plymouth was the opposite. The similarity, though, is that both are stories of small groups of ordinary humans, just a hundred each on the first boats, in extraordinary circumstances. In failure, in weakness, in success, in honor, they were just people trying to figure out where to go next, what to do next, and how to act in situations they'd never imagined. And we've left both colonies at a point where they're stable, but not prosperous. As we finish the story of Plymouth, though, we enter a new phase of English colonization. In the same year that John Robinson died, so did King James. And colonization under his son Charles I could not possibly look more different. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter. And you can find those links at the website AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to first-hand accounts and things. See you next week.